Hello, everybody. Welcome to our live meetup today. I'm Jenny DeFigueretto, the community manager at DVC. We will wait a couple minutes for people to collect. And while we do that, please let us know in the comments where you are viewing from and if you've ever used a vector database before. And so while we're here, I'll say hi to Noe. He's here. He will be doing our presentation today. Hi, so very nice to meet you all. So I introduce myself uh, in a bit. Yeah. The slides, but uh, just to let you know, I'm, I work at Sikara in France as a yeah. data scientist. Cool. All right, let's see if I can see what's happening in the chat. This is the first time we've done a live stream version of this. So um, I'm excited. Oh, I see somebody from India. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Hi, Gift. I see you from YouTube. Good to see you guys here. So very cool. All right. So let's get started. Uh, Noé Ashash is a lead data scientist at Sikora, where he is currently helping to develop its LLM and generative AI expertise. He has worked on 10 plus AI and data engineering projects, and we are excited to have him share how to choose a vector database in 2023. By all means, uh, to our viewers, please put your questions in the chat and I will get to them when he's done with his presentation and we'll work through all those. So from that, take it away, Noe. Thank you very much. So presentation up here. Let me start. Can you see my slides? Uh, now we can. All right. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. I think you should be able to. Can you see it or you can't see it? We can see it, yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, vector databases. And uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Noé I'm from France, and I work as a lead data scientist at, at Sikara. It's, uh, it's a company developing data science and data, data engineering products for the clients. Uh, I've been working there for three years, and before that, I was uh, at Freelytics playing with uh, optical character recognition. Uh, so some relevant experience I have on vector databases are uh, projects I did at Sikara, which are detecting objects in videos, and uh, once you detect them, you have to match them to a large list of objects. So these objects were naturally embedded in a vector database and developing a semantic search, so for Q&A of our documents, which is becoming quite classic uh, for our uh, notion internally at uh, Sikama. I made a talk at uh, PyData Berlin uh, in April uh, regarding building a visual search engine using self-supervised learning. So this search engine was built upon the Victor database and uh, an article about how to choose your Victor database, which is why we are all here today. Um, so today we're going to do a quick recap on uh, what is vector similarity search, uh, what kind of use case can you have, and what are the indexing algorithms. Then we're going to jump into the main part, which is the vector databases comparison. And finally, we will see how we can iterate on vectors using DVC. So on to the first part. Um, so here is a classic pipeline to do similarity search over uh, textual documents. Um, so you basically have all your documents and embedding generator. So usually a transformer model, but it could be anything really contains the number of words. It could be like many other parameters uh, to build a fixed size vector. And you put all these fixed size vector in your vector database and uh, during uh, your live inference, you have a search query and use the same embedding function to build a vector, which can be compared to the vector of the database, and you can retrieve the most similar results. Um, how it works, basically, imagine your vectors are not uh, 800 or 1000 dimensions, but they are only if there were only two dimensions, you could plot them in, uh, in this space. And um, let's say you try to input roses are red 
uh, and get the most similar text from your database, what you will see is that the points you will, you will draw will be very close to points which are semantically similar, like violets are blue, but very far from points which are not semantically similar, like sugar is sweet. So you would retrieve uh, phrases like violets are blue because they are semantically similar. Um, although vector, database, uh, vector databases became very famous for textual search with the rise of LLMs, uh, keep in mind um, they are also very often used for images. So and it works exactly the same, but instead of having textual documents, you use images. And uh, your embedding generator will be adapted to images. So it could be a conv convolutional neural network, a visual transformer, and many other ways to embed your images. And then it works exactly the same. So now on to uh, the use cases. So regarding uh, the use of images, uh, let's say you are a large company and you want to authenticate the person showing up in front of your uh, office be belongs to your company. So you could embed uh, the picture of all your employees, put it in a database, and whenever an employee sh shows up, it takes a picture of the employee, compares it to the other picture in the database, and tries to match it to, um, to one of your employees. Uh, another way could be uh, building a recommendation system like uh, Google Lens. So whenever you take a picture of a clothes, it recommends you a uh, similar clothes from the millions and millions of clothes it has in its database. So to do so in a fraction of a second, uh, it basically embedded all the clothes and uh, embed your, uh, the clothes you're, you're taking a picture of and com compare them all together using a vector database. And finally, just to take the big picture, uh, you could just have a very large uh, image database and you don't know how to leverage its potential. So use a vector database to basically be able to retrieve images from other images. Um, for text, it's uh, using vector database for like documents and text. Uh, one common use case is uh, long-term memory when interacting with a bot. So let's say you've been talking with a bot like ChatGPT uh, for a very long time. Uh, what happens is that in uh, every one of your requests, it's, uh, it puts all the chat you've done so far in the prompt. And uh, the problem with that is that it becomes very slow and uh, you may be out of uh, token limits. So a way to avoid this issue is to embed all the messages you had so far. And whenever you ask a new question, it embeds it, compares, compares it to all the embeddings you have so far, and just use in the prompt the two or three most similar, most similar texts. Since we are talking about a very small amount of data here, although we use similarity search, vector databases may not be appropriate, but still it's similarity search. And another famous use case is a Q&A over a large number of documents. So let's say you have a large textual document and you want to retrieve the information you need uh, from your documentation using natural language. So you just embed all your documents or parts of your documents, chunks, and then ask a question, embed it, and compare it to your, uh, to your documents. And optionally, you can use an LLM at the end, which is uh, very often done. Uh, to basically get your most similar documents and answer your questions. So now about the indexing algorithms. So when you compare your, when you embed the document and want to compare it to some other documents, if there are only four like here, it will be quite fast. But as your number of documents increases, if you have to compare it to every single document, uh, the time complexity will increase. And uh, as the number of documents increase, it will become unfeasible. So this is why um, scientists have developed indexing algorithms, which allow to compare your input document to only a few documents to retrieve the most similar ones. And the two most famous ones are EVF, IVF, 
um, inverted uh, file index and HSNW. Um, here, he, uh, I don't remember the exact name, but we'll see it in a bit. Uh, so let's just uh, walk through these two, um, these two methods quickly. Uh, here I'm using a graph from uh, Pinecone, which made a great article about them. Uh, so EVF is quite straightforward to understand if you, al if you already work with uh, nearest neighbors. So you just um, you have a fixed number of, uh, of neighbors of, uh, and uh, you're basically clustering your, uh, your data points, your embeddings. So each point here is an embedding. And basically at inference, you, co you, you, compare, you compare it to like all the... Um, all the, the, the century of all the clusters and then search within the cluster with uh, which is the closest to your, uh, to your data points. You can choose to like uh, not only search the, the cluster which is the closest to your data points but also the nearby uh, clusters because sometimes if your, uh, if your point is really on the edge of the cluster you may not find the exact, uh, the exact good point so to improve the performance, it could be better. The second one, second solution is a bit trickier to understand. It's a hierarchical uh, navigable small world uh, graphs. And it's basically based on skip lists. So how skip lists work, uh, I'll try to explain it the best I can. But basically you have a fixed number of layer and um, skip list is, a, is an algorithm to find a number within an ordered list. So your list is ordered, you're trying to find 11, and you, fix, and you have a fixed number of layer, and uh, the top layer will make very big jumps, and the lower layer will make smaller and smaller jumps. And what you do is that you start from the st top layer, which make big jumps, so you arrive to five, Five is lower than 11, so you go to the next step. You arrive to the end, so you come back to five. Then you go to layer two. You do the first step, you arrive to 11. 19 is higher than 11, so you come back to five. You go to layer one. You do the first step, and you arrive to 11, so you find your number. So the idea is to find 11 in a limited number of steps. And uh, HNSW is actually built uh, upon that. Uh, here you find the layers again uh, as in skip lists and each point is an embedding. And what you do is um, you compare every time uh, from the top layer to the bottom ones, uh, your embedding to, um, to, the, to the embedding you, you're working through. So here, you, is, this is your entry point. You compare your, imp your query embedding to this one and then this one, you find out that this embedding is closer. So when you go down the next layer, you start from this embedding. Then you compare it to this one and this one. You find this one is closer. So you work for this one and you keep working, et cetera, et cetera. Then when you arrive at this embedding, you find out that it's closer, it's closer to your uh, embedding than any of the other embeddings here. So you go to the next layer and so on. And here, it's not very um, meaningful because there is a small number of embeddings, but when there is a large number, it avoids you from, uh, from working uh, through uh, all the embeddings. Um, quick, uh, so this is again a graph uh, made by, uh, by PyCon to see the difference between IVF and uh, HNSW. And uh, basically, the bigger the bars, the better it is. So what you can see is that HNSW has better quality search and better speed. The dashed line is just for the small differences uh, when you change the hyperparameters. But what you can see is that it takes more memory. So HNSW is not as good as IVF when, you co when considering memory, but it's usually not what's uh, the most important, so HNSW tends to be preferred. Uh, now let's work uh, on the big part, so comparing uh, vector databases. So here, 
is a list of uh, some vector databases. So it's not exhaustive. There are many others that are rising, uh, mainly with the hype. Uh, a lot of people are trying to uh, jump into this business. But these are the solutions that I found to be the most popular ones. Uh, this is why I chose them. So I split them into two categories. The first one is uh, dedicated vector databases. So basically solutions which are built only to search vectors. And the second one is general purpose database. So database which are here, which have been here for a long time and decided to develop a feature uh, for vector search. Uh, the comparison criteria I go through will be will be performance, ease of local usage, whether it provides a managed cloud, whether it provides a user interface, and uh, they did a, add a recent fundraising and the specificities they may have. So it's all inspired from an article I wrote recently on how to choose your vector database in 2023. I will specify 2023 because things are moving very fast so it will probably be outdated in 2024 so performance um, dedicated vector databases tend to be more efficient than general purpose uh, databases because they are built specifically for that so they will implement features infrastructure specificities etc to be optimized for vector search um, Dedicated vector databases, so they vary in implementation. For instance, ChromaDB here is implemented in Python, which may not make it as fast as the other ones. I haven't tried it, so I can't tell it for sure, but it's my guess, and it's also the guess of many people. Uh, on the other way, Wave 8 is uh, coded in Golang, uh, Qdurant in Rust, and these are two databases that really focus on speed. So making them quite performant. I did not uh, compare them like you know, in a graph or, or, or anything because in some benchmarks, some say one is, better, is more performant than the other. Some other benchmark says the other one is more performant. It really depends on the, the size of your vectors, the hyperparameters, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite hard to compare them. Um, finally, a uh, thing I want to point out is uh, performance does not usually matter for small use cases. It is, it is that most people, a lot of people use uh, vector databases, let's say for Q&A of our documents, when they have like a, a thousand or a few thousand of documents. And when doing so, it's considered a small use case. And so you don't really have to bother about performance. They will all be very performant including the general purpose databases. Uh, the, um, I said they were, less, they were probably less performance, but this will be, you will really see it when you come to like millions of vectors. So if you already have a PostgreSQL or an Elasticsearch in your stack, and you only want to index a few thousands of vectors, don't bother bringing another, another tool to your stack. Uh, regarding the ease of local usage for this dedicated vector database, um, the worst one is uh, Pinecone because it's not open source. It's actually the only one which is closed source, so you can't use it locally. Then uh, Milverse is open source, so you can uh, start playing with it. Uh, it's quite hard to deploy when you want to uh, use it for production purpose because it's working with like a lot of pods which interact with each other which may be buggy sometime, and it's quite hard to debug. Uh, then uh, Qdurant and Wavy8 implement a feature which allow to uh, save them as a disk file or in memory. So in memory, so not saving them at all, just uh, keeping, them, keeping it your, in your RAM. And these features make them very easy to iterate locally. Uh, let's say if you want to try to test them in the CI, or if you want to uh, do experiments with them mainly if you're working with a DVC, uh, where you want to version your experiments, you can basically version the file that represents your database. I will actually uh, show it uh, a bit uh, more deeply at the end. And finally, the best one for iterating lo locally is uh, probably Chroma. 
And I think that's what they aim to be, like ease of local usage, because since they are written in Python, it makes it very easy to use and to, uh, to customize for your needs. Because more data scientists and people working with data know Python uh, compared to Golang or REST. Uh, do they provide managed cloud? So yes, they do, all with a free tier, and uh, except for uh, for Chroma DB. Uh, they, as we will see later on, they all made uh, major uh, fundraising recently, and so it's a bit like uh, Uber Eats when they raise too much money, <laughs> they can just like provide a lot of uh, uh, free tiers and goodies and. Uh, and freebies. So here it's uh, it's what we see. So they all provide a feature. So it's really great actually to get started. Uh, the only one I use with the free chair is uh, Qdrunt. And uh, actually managed to hold uh, hundreds of thousands of vectors in it and can go up to millions. Uh, so without paying anything, which is actually quite cool. Uh, same uh, same graph for the user interface. They all do except Chroma. And uh, so again, user interface is great to uh, to have a quick overview of whether your database is up. If you're struggling to work with your clients, uh, to make some testing, and they uh, try to implement more and more cool features to uh, help you with your development. Uh, about fundraising, so why am I talking about fundraising here to compare them? Because I think it's a good indication of the attractiveness and development potential of the database. Again, um, it also depends on where they are in the world. So as you may assume, uh, Pinecone is in the Silicon Valley to raise that much money. And I think uh, many of the other ones are. Uh, so yes, yeah, so they all raise millions to do pretty much the same product. So we will see how it will evolve uh, over the years, but um, probably they will use this money to like give a lot of free, trust, free, free stuff like um, manage clouds. Uh, about the specificities they may have, so from what I said, so Qdrunt, uh, it's coded in Rust. Uh, they want to be very performant. I heard from someone uh, they were playing with uh, trying to hold a billion vectors with as few in as few uh, gigabytes as they could. So they are really trying to play um, to play with performance. Uh, it's quite easy to for your local usage as well uh, for experience. So it's quite complete overall. Uh, Chroma DB, um, probably not as performant as the other one since it's code in, Pyth in Python. Again, I say probably, I haven't tried it and made a proper benchmark. But it's very easy to customize. So if you have a really custom uh, need and want to try stuff quickly, uh, it's probably the go-to. Wave 8 uh, probably the same remarks as for Qdrunt. Uh, it they want to be very fast as well. Uh, they push forward the fact that can be uh, called with GraphQL, so they work on user interface, etc. Uh, Milvus, it's uh, it's the oldest one actually. So when I started using uh, vector databases before the LLM hype. Uh, it was it was the one I was using because it was actually the main one. It has been proved to work on many use cases, but uh, last time I used it at, at least, uh, it was quite buggy and I had uh, some struggles, which is why I moved on. And Pinecone, uh, uh, it's probably as efficient as the other one, uh, but it has a, ma a massive drawback, which is it's closed source. And uh, I don't think it brings on any major uh, feature, which can explain the fact that which can uh, make up for the fact that it's closed source. So now, just to conclude, before the question, let's see how we can uh, iterate on vectors using uh, DVC. So as I told you at the beginning, 
I'm working on uh, internally on a project of uh, Q&A of the documents. So we have a notion of uh, 200 or three, 300,000 uh, pages, which we are splitting into chunks. So building up, to, so and um, east of these chunks go to an embedding model. So we are using uh, uh, embedding ADA2 from OpenAI. Uh, since we, we are using both French, in, our documents are both written in French, in English, we talked about code. There is no open source model which is near as good as text embedding ADA2. So we can't really do any fine tuning for the moment. And we put them into our vector store, which is Qdrunt, and then uh, use the LLM to generate an answer. But what we'll focus on today is this part. So not the LLM part. Uh, so we also have an experiment, uh, experimental pipeline for ingesting our chunks and uh, comparing how how they work. So like if we want to iterate, our, iterate on our chunks, etc. So we have a subset of our notion for iteration speeds, then many steps like querying our notion, creating the chunk, the embedding, etc., which are orchestrated and version with DVC. We put them in Qdrunt and we can visualize them with Streamlit. Visualizing, visualizing with Streamlit is very important because um, it's quite hard to have a proper label data sets and have a metric you can uh, reuse, uh, we can compare over time. So you have to do a lot of visualization to make sure you're not downgrading your performance from one experiment to another, like changing your chunk size, uh, adding more metadata, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we do, and a good way to do so, is um, to, since we use uh, DVC, we can version the versions, uh, we can version the, our Qdrunts from uh, one experiment to another. So not the one which is deployed in production, but the one we use as a disk file for our experiments. So let's say we, we did an experiment a while ago. Now we are doing a new experiment and we want to make sure we are only improving our results compared to the last experiment. So we can use uh, DVC to like retrieve both files here we haven't changed our embedding model. It's still text embedding ADA2, so it works. And ask the question to both our databases, get the most similar documents, and compare them with, with Streamlits. So this is what it looks like. Uh, here is like uh, the list of uh, commits where I changed my uh, database, I changed my, my results. I will show you afterward the code. I can ask a question, for instance, uh, what is a bug? So according to our documentation. And I can see the documents I'm retrieving on my current version and on the older version on, on the older version. So here I can see on the older version I was trying to make uh, much bigger chunks. Now I'm trying to make much smaller chunks, but the documents are still quite the same. So I can like have an overview of like is using smaller chunks a good idea or not for my use case. Um, so the code to do so is quite easy. So first, uh, use uh, the Git library to retrieve the commits. Um, it's a list of commits, so files changing paths. So I can just put my uh, the path to my dvc lo dvc .log here, and so it will retrieve all the commits where the dvc .log changed starting from the commit where I, where I introduced student in my database. So the list of commits I have here are all the commits where my dvc.log change from the commits where, in, where I introduced the uh, student uh, database. Um, then you can use the dvc uh, library. So this is uh, an object a class from the from the DVC library, and I can uh, doing so from a revision, so um, a commit, which I retrieved with the previous function, can retrieve the student database from this commit and download it locally. And finally, for each of these database, I can pop the student pop the student client. 
um, get my embedding model, embed my query, and then search within the client. So the, we, this is the name of my collection. This is my embedding and whether I want to retrieve the metadata associated to it and get my results. And then I just have to uh, display them in string it. So to conclude, as I said, if you already have a PostgreSQL in your, or an Elasticsearch in your stack, use the integrated vector search tool. Uh, except if you're starting from the beginning, if you are dealing from the beginning with a large number of vectors, like several hundred of thousands of vectors, start from, uh, from this tool to make your stack easier. And when cost or latency become an issue, consider using a, vector, a dedicated vector database because it can sometimes, when you're dealing with like millions of vectors, um, it will allow to uh, dramatically lower cost or latency. Um, vector databases with managed clouds and free tiers are ideal for kicking off vector search projects. As I said again, in my opinion, uh, Qdrunt and Wavy8, so as I said, they are very performant uh, and they allow to use the same tool for your experiments. So saving the database as a disk file and in, as in, in your production pipeline. So a database properly deployed. So they are very good choices for data scientists who want to iterate on their experiments. When I was using Milvus, I wasn't finding, I didn't find such a feature. Maybe it's out now actually, but uh, so I was using another tool for my experiments and uh, it makes my code uh, actually much more complicated than, than it is now using Qdrunt. And finally, since it's very hard to uh, have an actual data set which give a metric uh, you can iterate on, you have to do a lot of visualization. So DVC plus Streamlit really is iterations. So I show it for vector databases, but also to iterate on your large language model results. So having the results uh, on, from one commit on the one side, on one side, and from another commit on the other side, it really helps to ensure you're not lowering your performance. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Feel free to add me on LinkedIn or check my GitHub. And um, we also have a technical blog at Sikara where you will find my article on uh, vector databases and many other articles I wrote and uh, my uh, peers uh, wrote as well. So yeah. please let me know if you have any questions. All right, great. Thanks so much, Noe. This was amazing. I, in particular, really liked um, your slides and your presentation was great. The diagrams that you had were very helpful to help understand all these things. So I love that. And I love the criteria that you set up for like trying to decide amongst all these things. That's super helpful, I think, to everybody. We do have a few questions from uh, the audience. So I'm just going to put these up here. Uh, so the first one is from Rajesh. How about MongoDB as a vector database? May we choose it for a large scale application? Uh, so I haven't looked into it, but my guess would be, um, since it's not dedicated for that, it will probably not be as efficient as the other ones. Uh, again, I can't say for sure without uh, seeing the benchmarks, but if you're dealing with millions of vectors, it would be probably uh, a better choice to uh, use a de dedicated vector database. If you're only dealing with a few thousands and you already have a MongoDB in your stack, go for MongoDB. Cool. Okay, we did have somebody bring up, uh, ja Jacob brought up about Milvus. It should be noted that Milvus has the only production ready disk and implementation among those databases. So it can work on disks disk natively. So I wanted to okay. share that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for bringing it to me. Uh, yeah, it is. there's so many things changing all the time and so many features being added. I just want to make sure we're covering all the bases. Um, let's see what else came up. Uh, Olena had a question. Thanks for all the info. It's very useful. Are there any vector databases that have ready-to-use vector density estimation except ChromaDB? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by vector density estimation. Can you maybe clarify, or maybe I'm just not familiar with the concept? Like how, is it like an, 
I assume it would be like an estimation of how close they are in the space. Uh, but I haven't um, put my attention into it, so I can't answer that question. Sorry. Okay, I'll see if she comes back up with more questions. Uh, we have one more here. Uh, is the project available on GitHub? No, it's not, but I can share my... We are planning on uh, open sourcing it, maybe in a bit. Cool. Yeah, uh, it seems like there's a lot of interest for that. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, the next one that just came up is from Andreas. You didn't mention FAISS yes. for similarity search. How does it perform with the ones you mentioned? I did not mention it because it's not a database. Uh, it's just implements the vector search algorithms. So, for instance, you can you can't put any metadata, and uh, you want to uh, deploy it, you have to come up with all the infrastructure. But it's a great algorithm, and if you just want to uh, to have a local to, to have for if, if you just want to use it for local usage, it's uh, it's very good. Let's say you're like uh, I don't know your your training. Um, your training and algorithms, and uh, at all your iteration, you have to index everything in the database to like only retrieve the close the closest embedding to the best um, to have the best uh, contrastive loss or anything. Uh, this is a good choice. Cool. All right, we have another question here from Giuseppe. Is this session recorded, and if so, where can it be found? Uh, yes, the session is being recorded. It will be in YouTube. It will be in like a little purgatory situation while I do a little bit of editing for it, but it'll probably be out in full later this afternoon um, after this live stream. So yeah, um, do we have any other questions? Let me see, my colleague was here. I'm not sure if he has any questions. So I think I'll just wait a couple more minutes, but I want to thank you. This was amazing. Uh, so much great information. This space is just like every morning you wake up in the morning, there's something new and you're like, ah, so it's really great to have somebody here that is helping like figure stuff out and, um, you know, trying to make sense of it and give us, you know, a pathway of how to get there. So it's been, been super, super helpful. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Um, I have put links to the slides into the chat. Um, I have put, uh, as I said, it will be recorded and that'll be available later. Um, I will put the links to the slides also in the description of the YouTube. So it'll always be there. You don't have to worry about it too much. Um, but with that, um, great talk. Thank you, Noe, for being here. Thank you all of, who, all of you who attended for joining us and your great questions that you had to add to the conversation. Uh, we look forward to having more of these meetups uh, going on forward. We do have a Seattle meetup for, I did notice there was a couple of people from Seattle in the LinkedIn. So we are having a Seattle meetup on October 17th. If you want to join us, look out for more information coming out about that. And um, with that, that's what we have for today. Until next time, we will see you around. Thanks everyone for being here. And thanks so much, Noe. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.